We are so excited to have the fabulous Lynn Slater with us today for a very special episode of School of Hustle. Lynn, thank you for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. And thank you all for showing up. What a beautiful room tonight. This is gonna be a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun ahead. Um, I, I think that it's probably most appropriate to start by asking you about what you're wearing. You look, you look beautiful when you walked in. I, you know, you, you, you're so stunning and, and so elegant. I love your shoes. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you're wearing tonight and what it means to you? I want it to be comfortable so I could enjoy myself. And I, I am a little obsessed with pajama looks, but this is uh, amping that up. And it's from Stina Goya. And I'm wearing Chloe shoes and a bag. And let me remember, vintage earrings. It looks great. Thank you. Now, you have been into fashion from the start. And from what I know about you, you were in Catholic school mm -hmm. and you got very creative about how you would express your individuality in spite of the fact you had to wear a uniform. Yes. How did you do that? Well, I think that's a, that's a big part of my story, which is starting with um, sort of a small box and being creative in a box. And so, uh, we were not allowed to have any accessories, no jewelry. We were all supposed to look the same, no makeup. But we were allowed to have religious medals and rosaries and things like that. So I used them as accessories. And so I would make these different combinations on my uniform. I would put rosary beads around my arm like a bracelet. So you worked within that box? I did. You, you pushed the envelope right up to that line. Exactly. Did anyone Story ever? Story of my life. Did anyone ever <laughs> <laughs> tell you not to do that? Or did they say, good No, job. because they couldn't. And yeah. you see, that's the, the place you have to find is, um, you know, in every situation where you think you don't have power, if you look very, very carefully, there's some tiny, place that you can. And so they had said you could wear medals. They didn't say how you could wear them. And so what could they say? I was wearing medals. <laughs> Academics are very important to you. And you have your PhD in social welfare and you are a professor at Fordham. Um, how did you grow into such a substantial role at the school? Well, I um, have been in social work a very long time. And uh, in, in my social work career, I've also done a lot of reinventing. And so I have about a five year time frame where I decide to try something new and then I'll get very good at it and then I'm ready to move on. And so I did that in my career as a social worker, um, which is why I love that degree, because it lets you do many, many things. So um, before I went to Fordham, I was working with lawyers. Um, I was representing uh, with lawyers um, kids who uh, were in the child welfare system and really making sure that their voice and their story and what they wanted was in the room because most of the time it was everyone else making decisions. And at that time I was starting a PhD program and Fordham was starting a big collaboration with their school of law and they wanted to have uh, social workers in all of their clinics and they wanted to have courses with social workers and law students. And they recruited me to teach because I had been doing that for a long time. And academics played a very important role in you launching your blog as well. Why was that important to you? And, and how did you use academics to launch your blog today? Well, I think, I think 
a lot of times people underestimate the intelligence of people who love fashion. And I knew that there were a lot of people in the world who understood that fashion is not just about trends. Fashion has been part of social movements. I think right now it's a really super exciting time for me as someone committed to social justice to be in fashion because fashion has decided they're taking on a lot of these issues. So there's a lot of inclusion, uh, diversity work. There's a lot of um, looking at uh, sustainability and, and fair wages and human rights. And so it's a, it's a really, people are beginning to see that fashion has a lot more power than we ever thought it did. And so I, I knew there were people who knew that, so I just started to write in that way. And I certainly found out that my guess was true. How did you name your blog, Accidental Icon? So uh, that story always gets conflated in the press. And um, what happened was, I work at Fordham Lincoln Center, which is about a block away from uh, Lincoln Center when they had the fashion shows there. And so I was, it was the first week of school, I was really dressed up because I like to wear something outrageous for the first class. And I went to meet a friend for lunch and I was standing on the plaza and a couple of photographers came over and started taking my picture, and then uh, a bunch of other photographers came, and there were some journalists from Japan. They came to interview me, and then the tourists thought I was someone famous, <laughs> and they started taking pictures of me, and they w were wanting to take selfies. And so when my friend came, she said, ah, accident you're an accidental icon. And I had been, my blog was ready to go, but I had been struggling with the name. So that's how I got the name. The press seems to think that that's how I got famous. And so for the purpose of School of Hustle, I want to say that that was how I named my blog. And it took really hard work every day, um, really working on social media, producing good content, um, just working like 10 hours a day to, be, to get at the point where I became well-known. Yeah. So it was not a you know, magic moment because people took my picture. It involved a lot, lot more than that. It usually does. Yes. There's usually <laughs> not one quick moment to reach success, but a lot of hard work along the way. Absolutely. How do you hope to liberate and inspire people through fashion? Well, I guess um, I really, when I first started, I had no agenda, except I was really kind of bored and I wanted to express myself in a different way that was more creative um, than academia. I wanted to write in a more creative way. And so because I wasn't in fashion, I had no idea about how fashion worked. I just knew I loved clothes. And a lot of people had told me all throughout my life, but even more recently that I should start a blog, you have great style. And so I just um, started taking pictures writing about an article of clothing or a designer. And um, pretty soon I got noticed and that's how it happened. So I think what has ended up happening, which wasn't intended, is that I have perhaps given people a different way to think about what it means to get older. And on Instagram, interestingly, the majority of my followers are 25 to 45. And when I speak with 25-year-olds, um, 
it's interesting. They say that they're not thinking, oh, I'm going to be 26. That's great. They're thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be 30. I'm getting old. I haven't done this. I haven't done that. I haven't done this. And so what people in that age group have told me is that I'm letting them see that it's never too late. I was 61 when I started this, and it's just become, like I couldn't have dreamt it. And um, I wear things that any age woman would wear because it just feels good for me and my style. So I think in that way, I've changed culture a bit. I've made being older look like kind of cool and exciting and fun. So it's not something that you have to fear and start trying to change yourself and be worried about. I, I love a particular quote from you. Uh-huh. Here, here's a quote. The more I research fashion, the more I realize it's a powerful force. We talk a lot about how it's oppressive or how it promotes ideal body types, but we don't talk about how it can be productive. How does fashion lend itself to productivity in society? Well, I think for me, um, you know, it's a, it's a really great example of how I, through clothing, through fashion, through how I style myself, um, became, was able to break into a world, and I think social media has a lot to do with it, um, that was pretty much controlled, right? So 15 years ago, I doubt that I someone like me would be considered to be a person in fashion. Um, I don't fit the, the stereotypical mold of who was supposed to be. So I think that's the wonderful thing about technology and social media is it's a great equalizer and it's given us power. And I think that's how fashion can be productive. Also, since I'm a researcher, there's a lot of research now that shows that um, what you wear actually impacts your brain and your performance. And so there's been studies that have been done um, repeatedly with the same outcome where they take two different groups of uh, subjects and they all have are tested so they're equivalent in their performance levels and they'll give them a, a, a blazer and they'll tell one group that it's from Prada and the other group that it's from H&M and the one who thinks it's from Prada will always perform higher and they've done similar experiences with white coats they tell one group that uh, they're a painter and one group that they're doctors and the ones that think the code is a doctor's code perform higher. So it, it really, it, it's a little complicated because it's how you think about what you're wearing and what you have in your head about it, but it's a very powerful force. And so for me, I think about how I can use what I wear to express myself or even to get an outcome. And so I'll think about, okay, what do I have to do today? What do I want to happen? Who do I have to meet? What do I want them to think when they look at me? And then I very purposefully get dressed. And so when you... When your styling and your fashion comes from inside of you instead of outside, you begin to have more power. And right now, it's okay to be different. It's getting more and more okay to be different. And I think we should all be controlling how we want to be represented. And... So for me, I'm controlling how I want to be represented as an older woman because the way that society 
thinks of older women is not okay with me. And so I'm not having it. <laughs> there is some scrutiny around fashion's impact on the environment specifically. Um, what do you consider um, when you buy clothing given some of the environmental impacts that the industry has? Well, for me, actually, my personal wardrobe um, is pretty much from consignment and thrift stores. So I really have always had a habit of, of using recycled clothes. Um, I'm in a very enviable position right now because designers give me a lot of clothes, um, which is really nice. But I will also recycle them. So, for example, Housing Works always does a big fashion uh, for AIDS. And this year, I gave them my closet. So I gave a lot of clothes that I had gotten from designers for that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of brands are starting to realize that they have to do something. Mm -hmm. I think there are some brands that have been doing it really well. And so I think um, being thoughtful about what you buy, being creative um, with how you style yourself and reusing things. Like I do, if people look at my Instagram, I don't care, I'll wear the same thing that I wore in other posts because I love it. And so I might wear it a different way, but you'll see a lot of repeating of my personal clothes. And so that's how I think about it. What is the difference between thinking and talking about fashion versus consuming fashion? Mm. Well, I think it's just that, right? Yeah. That you're not just buying it, but that you are, I, I, that you know who you are. And so when you're going to, get something that it is advancing who you are. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to this event. What should I wear, et cetera? I cannot tell anyone else what to wear. I don't give style advice because my belief is that style is intensely personal and that it should convey who you are. And so I'll say to women instead, um, and sometimes men, and I understand later a dog, um, <laughs> to think of maybe three words that describe them, their essence, and then to take a look at the clothes that they have, take a, an article of clothing and say, does that convey that? And if it doesn't, then you can recycle it. But if you have that in your mind, you're being a much more thoughtful consumer and you'll find that you may buy a lot of less things, but they're going to be more special. We talked about uh, social media earlier, but I'd like to ask you about how we can think about when, when we're posting in social media. You know, right. we, we love to post our clothes and things across Instagram and that space. Right. How can we use social to raise people up and not bring people down? Well, I think um, I have been very fortunate because I pretty much just show people my everyday life. Um, I'm not in Bali. <laughs> um, pretty much Calvin and I are on New York City streets. That's where yeah. we're shooting. Um, and, and actually, I got a wonderful comment on Instagram um, yesterday. And I made a screenshot because it meant a lot to me. The woman said, thank you for what you're doing, and thank you for doing it in a, in a way that you're not making other women feel bad about themselves. Yeah. And so I do think about that. And what I, I mean, look, people get what they see. I have gray hair, I have wrinkles, that's who I am. 
I'm fine with it. Um, Calvin is a film photographer, and he's graciously agreed to get a digital camera to help me. Um, but the consequence of that is he does not know Photoshop. No Photoshop on his computer. So at all of the pictures on my Instagram that aren't taken by professionals that are taken by Calvin have no retouch, nothing. And so I think people see that. They, they see me and they say, oh, I could kind of be like that. Um, it's not, I'm not so out of the orbit of, of the real world that it, I can't maybe inspire people to think about their own kind of ordinary life in a, in a more special way. With regard to negative feedback that you might pick up, I know that you get a ton of positive feedback, but there's always those trolls out there who say what they're going to say. You know, how do you address that negative feedback? Do you do that yourself? Do you lean into your community? How do you handle that? Well, you know, again, one of the things that has helped me a lot is I've had a career as a social worker. I've had a career as a, a professor. And so I know how to set limits, and I know how to deal with unpleasantness. Um, and again, I am very blessed, because overwhelmingly, my comments are positive, particularly on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I don't like Facebook, because people, for some reason, seem to be freer yeah. on Facebook. And so I really didn't pay attention to my Facebook for a while. Um, and then one day I looked at it, it was after some BuzzFeed video, and I had like 100,000 followers on it or new followers. So I said, let me look at it. And the thing that was sad to me was, you know, it was these judgmental negative comments from other women. And so I was about to just shut the page down because I do most of my stuff on my blog and on my Instagram. But I said, let me see if I could turn this around. And I've done a lot of group work before in my career, and I've had to deal with bullies and a lot of people in different scapegoats and all different roles in the group. So I basically set a manifesto about how people were going to behave on the page. I said, I'm going to be transparent with you. Uh, if your comments are judgmental, I'm deleting them. I shared research about the positive and negative impact of social media on women. And if you look at it, it's 50-50. It could be bad or it could be good. And so for me, I basically said, this is my page. I'm responsible for it. And I'm not going to have it be a place where it, any woman is going to feel bad. And so I want women to take risks. I want to encourage them. Because Facebook is generally my older um, group of followers, a lot of women who lost themselves during career and raising families. And now they're like, what happened to me? And I, I need to get back. Or they're hearing things like from their children. Oh, don't wear that. You're, it's, you know, you're too old for that. Um, and they're, they don't want to, they want to wear what they want to wear. So um, it took a long time. It, not that long, but it took a lot of hard work because I had to be in there monitoring all the time. And then finally, the culture changed, and all of the people on the page start addressing um, the co any negative comment. Mm -hmm. And um, now I always ask them questions like, I'll say things like, I'm the boss of my style, and I'm the boss of my life. How are you the boss of your life? And they put up these pictures, and they're doing all these wonderful things. So I think, I think it's 
if you take control over it. But a lot of people just put it out and they don't, right? But I found that you can change the culture of it if you want to. I, I'm learning so much and I feel so inspired listening to you. Thank you. Uh, you know, on the flip side of negative feedback comes a lot of positive feedback. And it can be hard to handle a lot of positive feedback too. I mean, it can be overwhelming, right? And you can potentially even lose humility or become a different person and let it get to your head. So how do you think about handling all the positive feedback that you're getting? Well, I'm gonna be 100% honest that I still find what has happened to me completely unbelievable. <laughs> that when I wrote that first blog post, if anyone told me what would happen, I would say you're insane. Mm -hmm. So I think because it still remains so unbelievable that it is easier to, to you know, have humility. But I, I also don't take myself so seriously. And I also know that this could go away tomorrow. And so I just am in the moment and I enjoy it. And um, I try to remember when I first started how many people were amazingly kind to me. And I, that's my mantra is be kind. So I do try, I try to respond to emails and um, stay engaged with my followers because I do know 100% that if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be sitting in this chair. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think by looking at them and, you know, knowing what's important in life, uh, you know, my family, people close to me, um, trying in some way to make the world better. Uh, I think that keeps you grounded. And what is one issue in today's world that is top of mind for you and why? Mm, that's a good question. Hmm. There's so many, unfortunately. Um, I, I think I'd be been becoming more concerned about uh, the earth and climate change and um, what we're doing to the quality of life. Because at the same time, I'm aware that technology and medical advances are having us all live longer. It's almost like we have a whole new period of life. So, you know, my mother just turned 92. And so it makes me think, well, if I'm like her, I could be doing this for 25 more years mm -hmm. or 30 even. And then I think of my granddaughter and I think if we keep on doing what we're doing, what is the environment going to be like for her? And so I've been becoming more concerned um, about that issue and looking at how fashion is contributing and what they can do differently. And um, probably I'm gonna be spending more time around that issue moving forward. Yeah, that's an important issue to me too. We have been very serious and we have really talked about some very important issues and gotten so much inspiration and advice. And now this is the part where we spice things up a little bit and play one of my favorite games called Hustle Time. Yeah. So, the spirit of the game is that we set a timer for 60 seconds. And I have two former uh, School of Hustle guests here in the front row tonight. Thank you for coming. These ladies know how it goes. We set a timer for 60 seconds. And the idea is that you say the first answer that comes to mind. Jonathan, we have 60 seconds on the clock. Okay. Beer or wine? Neither. Favorite part of a s'more? Chocolate. Top quality you look for in an employee? Creativity. Camping or glamping? Camping. 
Finish this sentence. When I dance, I look like. When I dance, I look like a disco queen. <laughs> New York City tourists, help with directions or keep on your own way? Help with directions. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Fly. The best chocolate in the world comes from blank. Belgium. King size or fun size? King size. Would you rather fly or talk to animals? Fly. Favorite holiday? Christmas. Instagram or Twitter? Instagram. Binge watch, watch weekly. I'm binge sorry. watch or watch weekly? Oh, binge. binge. Me too. But can I, but can I just for good measure ask this next one? Your go-to outfit. Oh. <laughs> right? I want to know. Jeans. Okay. Sneakers. Cashmere sweater. Particular color of sweater? No. Nope. Okay. Just soft, comfortable. Let's see how many we got through. That was fun. It wasn't yeah. bad, right? No, no. 11, 12, 13. All Lucky right. number 13. Nicely done. That's fun. On School of Hustle, we have a lot of um, entrepreneurs coming on the show every week. And like I said, two of them are here today. And um, we ask the same questions to everybody. And the idea is that um, no matter what line of business you're in, or your expertise, or your age, or your gender, or any of that, doesn't matter. Everyone has a thought about this same set of questions. And we like to see how that changes from guest to guest. Favorite part of your day? Early, early in the morning. How do you use your career to inspire others? Well, I have two careers. That is so true. So one, um, I try to inspire my students through the way that I teach. And I try to inspire my followers by what I write and how I get dressed. Ever felt like walking away? No. One thing you still need to learn how to take selfies. I'm really bad at it. <laughs> uh, what do you want people to learn from you? That being yourself as you are is absolutely enough. What's next for you? Mm, good question. I guess I can't say the answer to that because I just don't know what can possibly happen. So I'm just going to be open. Who inspires you? My mother, my daughter, and my granddaughter. Who challenges you? My granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we also let everyone know in social that you were coming tonight, and you did too. Thank you so much for putting that out in your network. Um, you know, I wanted everybody out there to have a chance to ask you something, and then watch, of course, we're going to um, have the final video out later this summer. And people were very excited to send questions, and I, I pulled a few of my favorites. Okay. And again, you can, you can keep these short if you'd like to move on through. I have six, okay? So um, the first question is, um, Every look you share looks fabulous on you. What is your favorite personal look? Well, I don't have a favorite. That's the whole point, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So that I, I am always experimenting and changing, so. Where is a place to shop for good quality clothing while on a budget? Beacon's Closet, Who consignment is stores. Who is your favorite writer? Oh, that's hard because I have so many favorites. Mary Gateskill. You are a fashion icon. Do you like clothes or shoes more? Well, based on the fact that I have a mountain of shoe boxes that was like a big avalanche the other day, I have to say shoes. What things, deep down, are you moved by? Very simple things, actually, like um, the way that the light falls on someone's face. Just small things inspire me. And what is your favorite phrase? No effing way. <laughs> <laughs>
The last question uh, in terms of advice goes is actually for our favorite pug, oh. Noodle. Hi, sweetie. How are you? Oh, look at you. You look fabulous. So Noodle just recently got this adorable bow tie, but I a few love it. people have told him that it doesn't fit his look. <laughs> I know. Can you imagine? What really? advice do you have for Noodle to follow his fashion instincts with confidence? And what other pieces should he consider to complete his look? Ooh. Well, Noodle, when the rare occasion happens and someone tells me that I shouldn't wear something, I will respond, well, it's a good thing I'm the boss of my style. <laughs> so I think you should say that to your friend. And I think you should do some polka dots. Now, can he mix the stripes with oh, the polka completely. dots? Okay, I think so too. Completely. <laughs> well, yes. So remember, Noodle, I'm the boss of my style. That's right. Yeah, yes, absolutely. The last, the last piece. I always like to close School of Hustle with a final thought, like a, like a, a good fortune cookie at the end of a great meal. And so I'm going to read three quotes. And see, um, I'd love for you to tell me um, which quote resonates the most with you and why. Okay. okay. Number one, fashion is about dressing according to what's fashionable. Style is more about being yourself. Number two, people will stare, make it worth their while. Number three, fashion is like eating. You shouldn't stick to the same menu. Fashion is like eating. You should not stick to the same menu. And that one's by Kenzo. Yes. You One knew that though. Favorites. You knew who all these were, right? <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for opening up tonight. Oh, thank you. This was so much fun doing this. I know that the audience has so many questions as well. Hi, I'm Haley. Um, so I do work for GoDaddy actually, but um, kind of coming from the brand influencer partnership side, when you um, get approached by a brand to work with them, What's like the number one thing that you look for when partnering with a brand? Is it the authenticity or is it necessarily like maybe the product that they have? What really, what's that number one thing? So for me, I have um, a basic bottom line, yes. um, which is if this is not a product that I would use or wear in my own everyday life, mm -hmm. I don't do it. And so for me, what was really wonderful about the GoDaddy um, campaign is that it was my story, that I started a website, which I taught myself how to do, Woo. and I, it changed my entire world. So it was a very authentic thing for me to do. Um, I believe that authenticity is your big currency. So for me, my followers would know in a heartbeat when I was promoting something that isn't me. And so that really is my bottom line. I've also been taking a stand um, and not doing, uh, trying to avoid products that are not inclusive, that are targeting a specific group, like over 60. Um, because I think that real inclusion means all ages, all ethnicities, all types of bodies, and that's where I'm aiming for. So I think uh, I do research brands. I see what where they're at in terms of their own values. And so I do make choices based on what feels like it's a good match for me. That's awesome. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Kristen Voss. It's nice to meet you. My question is, um, I was the granddaughter in the granddaughter, daughter, mother, grandmother um, for a, a part of my life when I was younger. And to be able to be a part of that, you know, 
all four of us being alive at the same time was just an amazing thing. Um, and we had a lot of conversations as women in the different stages of our life, even as I was a little girl, which gave me a really strong, solid, you know, understanding of, of women and relating to them. And I'm just wondering what roles have your granddaughter, your daughter, and your mother played in what you do with your life? Well, I'm the oldest of six children, and I have four brothers after me, and finally got a sister, who's, <laughs> who's also important to me in my life. My mother kind of had this notion that women were strong. She had the opposite gender orientation. Women were strong in her view, stronger than men, and men needed to be taken care of. That was my mother's view, but women should be on their own. And so I think that orientation really influenced how I thought about myself as a woman. And plus, I grew up in the 70s where there was women's liberation and gender roles were really changing. And um, I was very, very determined that I would really raise my daughter to be a independent, free thinker, which she most certainly is. Um, there's downsides of having a daughter like that, <laughs> which she is now finding out, since she is a mother, raising a very strong-willed uh, girl. So I think also I was always around nuns who, in their own ways, were really strong women. Um, and so I think all of that, I went to all girls Catholic high school, all girls Catholic college. Um, but there was something about that environment that encouraged you to, to really just soar. And interestingly, my daughter went to an all girls college, not a Catholic one, but she had the most rigorous amazing experience um, in that kind of setting. So I think all of, all of that, you know, and my mother and my daughter and my sister and now my nieces, they, they inspire me all the time. Thanks. All right, we've got time for two more questions. I'm going to throw this up here. Hello. Hello. Hello, I'm Callie. Hi, Callie. I loved listening to you, and something pinged when you said the word authenticity, because being in front of you, it's so clear that you really are an authentic person. But I feel like authenticity is now this catchphrase that's being yes. thrown around everywhere. And I'm a little bit curious about when you are on the other side, when you're consuming, absorbing, getting inspiration from other people, like what's the, how do you know when something's real and when something's just that brand? Because I have this like allergic reaction to the word now, even though I know you are authentic because it's such a thing. Right. So it's sort of, I feel the same way about the word influencer. Yeah. Right. It's such an annoying word. And I think, you know, you can influence people to buy things or you can influence them and influence culture. And so I, I think of the word influence in its dictionary definition. Um, yeah, and now authenticity is becoming a buzzword. So for me, uh, again, because I've been a social worker, I've been working with people for many, many years, I have a good um, ability to assess when someone is being real. I mean, that's much more like the word, I think. Um, and so I can pick up on it pretty quickly. But like you said, you're having a gut reaction now to that word. And that is a, a true authentic moment, your gut reaction. And so I trust mine also. And so when I'm around someone, I know, OK, not, not matching. The words, the behavior, not matching. And that's how you can always tell. Hi, um, my name is Jules. Um, I was one uh, kind of a two-parter. Uh, do you personally like to follow trends, and are there any for this spring that you've seen that you really like? No, 
I don't do Trump. <laughs> I'm very clear. I don't do Trump. I love that it. was a simple one. Okay. What was the second part? Yeah, so what was your second oh. question? You uh, are there any trends parter. that you've seen uh, that you think that you really enjoy, like for this spring? Well, I think um, I like the colors. So it's giving me a lot of choices. And I will do a color story. Um, based on what I think is a good look for me. So I think, again, it goes back to what I said earlier about my orientation to style. It really comes from inside of me. And, and what I hope is that designers will give me a whole ton of choices and then I will be the one who decides what the trend is for me. Lynn, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. And I know that everybody out here did too. I'm sure, yes. Remember, we are bringing School of Hustle out every week with fabulous entrepreneurs and inspirational stories every week on GoDaddy Social. So follow GoDaddy and we'll see you soon. Bye. Yeah.